Hello and welcome to this section of our course on structural bioinformatics, one of the oldest and most uh, well-developed kind of sub-disciplines within the field of bioinformatics itself. Now, if you cast your mind back to uh, the early days of this course, actually right back to the welcome video, we talked about different definitions of bioinformatics and how it can mean different things to different people depending upon where they're coming from. But we arrived at this kind of consensus definition of bioinformatics as the application of computers critically to the collection, archiving, organization, and then the all important analysis of biological data. And that really, you know, it can be thought of as this hybrid of biology and computer science, or in other words, simply computer aided biology. And it has this goal of going from data, which is often in abundance and often overwhelming amounts, to new actionable knowledge. Now, then the first question for us with this section is, well, what is structural mathematics? And the answer is pretty straightforward. It follows on from that definition of bioinformatics itself. It's really computer-aided structural biology. And the goals and the motivations and the aims of structural bioinformatics are the same as those of structural biology, which broadly are to characterize and interpret biomolecules and all the things that they interact with, you know, their assemblies at the molecular and the atomic uh, level of detail, really that fine-grained level of detail that's required to understand biochemistry and molecular mechanisms and how drugs work and how diseases affect uh, biomolecules. So the question then would be, well, for us, you know, as, as biologists, as clinicians or as bioinformaticians, why should we care about this field of structural biology and these goals and its intersection with bioinformatics? And the answer really is because these biomolecules are nature's robots, right? This, this quote or this idea of nature's robots comes from an old book by Tanford that describes the early days of structural biology and some of the, the technical and, and thought advances that happened back in the, those, uh, those days where he describes proteins as nature's robots and this drive to understand them. Because it's only by coiling into these specific 3D structures that they're able to perform their functions. Okay, so if we want to understand these things and how they work and how they go wrong, we really need to understand this level of detail. So if you cast your mind back again to those early uh, course videos where we introduced the molecular domain of bioinformatics, that's shown here, you know, going from genomes on one end and all, all the de derived information like literature and ontologies through to ex sequences and gene expression and then the proteins and the how we can cluster them into families and all the different databases that are associated with protein families protein sequences nucleic acid sequences structures and the things they interact with like the chemical entities all the way through to the kind of systems level of understanding that we're all thriving for it's really important to note that structural data is kind of central in this scheme, right? It's right here in the middle. Now, of course, it's also central in the field of molecular biology itself. We've got this kind of uh, hierarchy here, or this kind of holy trinity, if you will, uh, that goes from sequence that begets structure, that begets function, or sequence determines structure that determines function that lies at the heart of uh, molecular studies in biology. Now, over the last couple of decades, really the last decade in particular, it's become clear that there's some uh, missing information here that we need to go between these layers in the hierarchy. That is, we need to know about the energetics of the sequence and all the different structures that it could possibly encode to learn about what is most favorable, what is the most likely structure for a given set of conditions. And then that structure itself is not the be all and end all or tells us everything about function, of course, but that we often need to know about the dynamics, how these things kick and scream and move and change their shape and, and are regulated through changes in structure, through dynamics that can lead to function and functional control. Now, just to take a step back for a moment to make sure we're all on the same page, of course, by sequence, what I'm talking about here, if we, if we consider protein, for example, is the order of those amino acids or those beads on a string, what we often call the amino acid residues here. Now, I'm in this first panel showing just two flavors, if you will, of amino acids. There's the red, the so-called hydrophobic, you know, just like, uh, just like arachnophobic, you know, people who don't like spiders, these amino acids 
typically don't want to be surrounded by solvent, by water. They don't like that water environment. So they'll tend to become buried as we go to that next layer of the structure. And we'll have those hydrophilic, those green positions on the outside. Now this sequence, of course, it's it's unfolded. It's the those order of amino acids and it's highly mobile. And most typically it's inactive. It might become functional upon uh, upon binding or upon structure formation. And that's when we have that second layer, that ordered, precise arrangement in 3D of these amino acids. Now, these are stable. They're the kind of pictures that we see in our textbooks and those biochemistry books, those big tombs of things that we studied in those other courses. And they're compelling and they're beautiful and they're intricate, but they're not static. They're not like those textbooks uh, kind of gives the impression they are very dynamic entities. And in fact, they have to frequently be dynamic in order to function this final layer because it's only in specific shapes, what we call conformations or configurations, that these things can be functional or can control their function. For example, when some ligand binds or small molecule binds, the active site might close over to engage those catalytic machinery, those amino acids that do some chemistry, for example, to allow it to process and do its next step of, of function. So we're kind of used to this idea, right? It's not a foreign concept to us really, you know, in our everyday life, albeit on a very different scale, you know, we're used to machines that have functional moving parts, right? The structure is essential and the moving parts on that structure are essential to its function, like this bicycle or, of course, these kind of uh, robots that aren't nature's robots here, but from, from science fiction, of course. Now, if we think about it now, the, in the case of the bicycle, if someone gives you a parts list, right? This is a parts list of, of that bicycle shown in the last slide. Now, this is useful, right? It can tell you what you need to make the bicycle or to make the organism or whatever, if you think of genomics, this parts list that we get. And it's useful because, you know, it might give us some insight about some parts that are missing or that there's more of this part or less of this part than this other set of part lists that we have that might be associated with some misfunction of the device. But really, you know, although it's useful, it's far from the whole picture. It's not really given us the picture that we want or the view that we want to understand how the damn thing works, right? It doesn't really help us, this parts list, figure out how a bicycle works. What we would love to have, what we would really like to have is a kind of movie, right? We want this so-called full spatial-temporal picture. Now, spatial-temporal is just a fancy word for saying in space and time. We'd like to know you know, how the bike looks like as it moves down the road, that someone's pushing the pedals and the pedals moves the chain and that rotates this gear at the back, which causes the wheel to go around, etc. And if you pull this lever, things start to be inhibited, right? The brakes start coming on. We want this level of detail. And if we could have this, we'd have the ability to control it and engineer it and, and you know, fix it when it goes wrong and all those sorts of things with obvious applications, of course, in medicine and manufacturing and energy production and the like. Now, this isn't that far-fetched. Now, this is an artist's view. This is taken from a video from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute it's called the, the Inner Life of the Cell. This is just a little section of it. Here, I encourage you to, to, uh, to visit this YouTube link if you want to see more. But what it shows is this heroic job done by a single protein here, this, this uh, kinesin, uh, conventional kinesin, kinesin one so-called, that is moving this vesicle, this large blue membranous vesicle with cargo in it around inside eukaryotic cells on this track here called microtubules that give structure to eukaryotic cells, but are also like a highway for the delivery of cellular components to where they need to be in the cell. Now, if you see this video, you can see that, you know, this machine, this nature's robot, if you will, has moving parts, right? It has to actually change its shape in order to step along this microtubule track. These portions of the motor protein, this head domain or kinesin motor domain, actually binds a molecule of ATP, hydrolyzes it to its products and changes its shape, which allows it to bind tightly or weakly uh, to its track. And it does this in a cyclical fashion that's coordinated. These changes of shape will allow it to bind tightly or indeed to release. And this has to be coordinated with the other head of the motor protein, the other domain, allosterically, right? This concept of allosteric, right? Allo means other and steric site, right? This other site controlled from the Greek is, is one of the key things that 
changing shape and changing dynamics of these molecules allows us to do. So if you see a video like this, you know, even my grandmother, if I show this, will appreciate that these biomolecules have to have moving parts to work. And what we're talking about here is, of course, these different distinct conformations as these things go through their cycle of activity. They're active or inactive in specific conformations that allow for these precise reactions to be controlled. Now, a key concept here, if you bear with me for a moment, that a really useful kind of advance in the field came when uh, this proposal of an energy landscape kind of model to think about protein structure and protein dynamics and protein function was put forward. And the basic idea here is if we go, you know, along that vertical axis, that, that Y axis there, the up down axis, is that we have a notion of energy, right? Maybe free energy, for example. And if we move along that bottom axis, along the X axis there, we have a, a conformational coordinate, so how it changes shape. And it tells us that there are certain low energy configurations, the native state, this compact ordered native form, as compared to that unfolded, higher, comparatively higher energy forms that are there. Now, uh, and there's various details and things that biophysicists are interested in, like the barriers that separate these, these sorts of things and, and characterizing the unfolded state and the energetics of these processes. But for us, what I want us to note for our purposes here is that even in this native state, it's not just a single well or a single uh, conf conformation, if you will, as a single shape, but there are multiple uh, conf configurations or conformations here, right? Multiple kind of equal energy-like configurations, different shapes of these biomolecules that control its function. They might have the bound form that's bound with its natural ligand, like the one shown here with the little uh, diamond, where it binds its natural substrate and it's going to do something with it. There might be the unbound or so-called open form that it must change from when it binds. And there might be many other forms, like a bound with an inhibitor and a distinct conformation that locks it up in a uh, form that will stop it from being active, for example. So this concept of the energy landscape and indeed mapping this energy landscape via conformational characterization is kind of key to understanding how these things work. Okay, now the sections that we want to cover here, the menu for this uh, section of the course, I'd like to talk a little bit about the motivations and the goals for structural bioinformatics and then we'll get into these other sections in distinct videos. So let's uh, pause now and come back for the next video and we're going to talk about those main motivations for the field, the, the main kind of research questions that are still outstanding in the structural bioinformatics world. Okay, so join us then. Thanks.